Hello everybody, I am Zenith Rule, and welcome back to Diving Into DuckTales, a show where my co-hosts and I talk about each new episode in the DuckTales 2017 television series, and man, oh man, we have an episode to talk about today. But first of all, let us introduce our regular cast of characters First of all, to the moon is Cat McBerry. How are you doing, Miss Cat? Oh, I'm doing great. I am so excited to talk about this episode. I didn't think I would be, but man, am I excited. Excited! <laughs> and returning once again is Y2 Staller Eric. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. I'm also excited about talking about today's episode because it kind of confer well kind of confirms about what Cat was talking about last week. So, but we'll get to that. <laughs> I think the first thing is um you weren't here last time we recorded. So, Eric, give us a little bit of your thoughts on the previous two episodes that we covered because you did watch it with Cat, and you did have thoughts. It just you were busy at the time. Yeah, the work conf- uh, work schedule conflicts kept me from joining you guys last time. But uh, real quick, um, I liked them both. Um, I uh, I liked the I liked how we got more character development with uh, with Webby with the day tr- with the day trip of doom, uh, the great dime chase. Uh, I really liked I really liked that one because at least we get, um, at least at least we start to see a little bit more differentiation between, uh, between the different duck ca- between the different characters between Huey, Dewey, and Louie, especially with, uh, um, especially with, if, correct me if I'm wrong, if uh, with uh, Dewey look with Dewey finding out more about their mother and, uh. About Louis not doing, uh, not wanting to do work and stuff. So we get to see, so we get to see that it's not just all, all three of them just being all the same like in the original series, but we actually see more character differentiation. And I can tell, go as the series going forward, there's going to be more episodes where each of the, where it may focus on one of the three or two of the three. And I liked, and I like that, and I'm all for that. Another thing that we should address, and that has actually been brought to our attention by several different commenters, uh, a couple in the YouTube channel, uh, these things are kind of being aired out of order. Uh, The episodes that we have been shown up until Day Trip of Doom have been in order. However, there is supposed to be a Huey-centered episode in between that and the Great Dime Chase. And the reason why they didn't showcase that was because they wanted to promote it as a Christmas episode because it has snow. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes, because snow automatically equals Christmas. <laughs> I mean, like, I kind of get where you're going for because, like, after... I think we only have five or six more episodes and then the season's over. So you only have a limited number of episodes, and we're approaching the Christmas season, but just because it has snow doesn't mean you air it out of order. I'm, I'm wondering if this changes anything continuity-wise, but we're going to have to keep this in mind going forward that we're missing some information. And yes, it kind of gives a little bit more uh, intrigue, but also this kind of um, is bad because... We haven't gotten anything from Huey. We've gotten two Webby episodes, including the one we're talking about today. We've gotten a bunch of... uh, We've gotten a Dewey-centered episode. We've gotten two Louie-centered episodes. And we've gotten a lot of the supporting cast, but we haven't gotten anything with Huey. And you cut out the episode that features Huey just to promote your Christmas episode. It's like, from from a marketing standpoint... Maybe I understand, but from an audience standpoint, this is not going to be good. Well, I think it depends on the details of that said episode that hasn't been aired. Because I mean, it sounds like if it sounds like if there if it doesn't interrupt the the side story, you know, with the mystery of Della Duck, as long as it doesn't interrupt that, then you probably could get away with it 
airing it out of order. Um, but I think that's yet. But I think that's yet to be seen. I mean, it it might be awkward if they have something about that that's that we already know and that's shown in the Christmas episode. But um, I, I just hope. I think. I think we just hope that you know they know what they're doing as far as holding that off. As long as it doesn't hold off. In you know vital information you know with this overarching plot that we're watching. Yeah, I hope not either, because I I hate it when shows do that. Um, one of those like egregious examples is uh, when I watched uh, Power Rangers, and uh, yeah, they had like two clip shows, like for the season which is really weird, and one of them they made into a Christmas episode, and it aired after the the season finale so it made even less sense it's like it was like it's like they threw it together just so they had something to throw up for christmas time and it just it was mind-boggling and i really do hate it when shows do that because the only show i've seen that does it properly is steven universe because they like they go on hiatuses so often after you know doing their steven bombs but usually they manage to they manage to send her certain episodes during certain parts of the year to reflect the seasons going on in the show. That's the only time I ever see it right. But yeah, I absolutely hate it when when uh, episodes are shown out of order just because, oh, it's that certain part of the year and we want to, you know, blend in and, you know, promote it, even though it could possibly throw off, you know, continuity and confuse the hell out of people. And it's not like, you know, it's not like this show isn't popular. I mean... This is a very popular show, and the thing that we need to understand is that I don't think you need a Christmas episode in the first season of a show. If you're going to do it, if you're really going to do it, you should wait till the second season, or or if there's a mid-season break, the third season. Wait until you have established your show. We know the show is good. We have seen the show. We like it, you know... There's a lot of good things to talk about, but this throws a lot of things off, and a lot of the praise that I'm giving the show, I might take away just for this, not a knock against the show, but a knock against the producers for doing something like this. Um, I'm not sure if it's, I'm not sure who made this creative decision, but uh, this just, to me, is not a good move. I mean that also depends on if this is if the episodes that they have listed that we know of is going to be it for the whole season or if it's just going to be another like like a mid-season break or whatever cuz we don't know if the episodes that we're getting is it for the season or if this is a mid-season break. Part of me kind of feels like it is a mid-season break cuz I mean a lot of TV shows nowadays do this. I mean even even My Little Pony does this where they have like a mid-season break and then they go off for a couple months and then they come back with a couple more episodes that way they get like 20 episodes in for a season which is like standard for even for like an animated show so i part of me has this feeling that the episodes that we are getting like i have a feeling we're probably going to be doing more of this as time goes on well i mean yes because there's going to be multiple seasons but i mean uh as far as what this season goes for having more episodes than we already know of yeah, I mean, I, I just hope that, you know, it just doesn't, you know, cause anything to go out of order. That's the, my only concern. But I doubt that it will because, you know, this seems to be a well-written show. And it seems like it seems like this. I, I have the big feeling the Huey episode maybe is meant to be a little bit filler, considering, you know, how we jump from one episode that gives us a huge plot dump to another episode that gives us a plot dump at the end. So I, it kind of confused me, especially when I saw the uh, the promo for this episode, because I saw I saw that it was like about Webby making a new friend, and I'm like, wait, we're, we just got a Webby episode, and suddenly we're getting another one, and it's you know probably going to be another like filler thing. I'm confused. So I guess so. I mean, it's it's all good. You know, we're still getting like good episodes regardless. So here here's hoping that that, that you know. That, that they didn't really mess up in their decision to push it back. I mean, we can only hope. I just have one more thing to add before we move on. Um, this was actually done so much better in Gravity Falls because Gravity Falls had a Halloween episode, 
but uh, it didn't really fit within the season structure of the show. So what did they do? They had Summer Ween. The whole idea of that is is really brilliant, and I kind of wish they had done something like that with DuckTales, because I think they're capable of doing that. Um, but like we said, I we don't know how much this is going to affect things. We don't even know when this Huey episode is going to air. Uh, with that said, let's actually talk about the plot of this episode. So this episode, entitled The Beagle Boy Massacre, which, wow, uh, that's that's a little that's a little harsh for a kid show title, but yeah, how, yeah, what a deadly sounding title. <laughs> it's also a bit misleading, also in a way, but we'll get to that. Um, so this is a webby episode, like we said, uh, and it focuses on how Huey, Dewey, and Louie, uh, they're all gearing up to go on a trip on their boat, and they invite Webby, but not all of them are gonna fit in the boat. And she kind of laments the fact that they have this really big connection to each other and the fact that, like, they, they act like family. They act so close that sometimes she really doesn't understand a lot of the in-jokes, a lot of the humor. And this is very relatable for anyone who's had friends in other groups not understanding certain jokes or certain references. Like, um, I recently went up to New York uh, a few weeks ago. And I went to visit my friends over at Dub Talk. Uh, we do this anime uh, show where we talk about anime dubs. And I'm not quite as into anime as the rest of the group. I watch more mainstream titles, and they keep talking about shows that I have never heard of. And it does kind of make you feel left out sometimes when you don't understand what's going on. So, like, you can really relate to Webby for this. Like, I felt bad. I felt bad that she was kind of left out. Um, and, you know, she she is kind of left out of the boat because there's not enough room. And they go off and they leave her alone to herself. And so that that is the opening for the, for the episode. And I'm like, well... Um, it, it's not exactly an episode about Webby trying to fit in. It's about Webby feeling alienated by something that normal people are doing to make her feel upset. It's a little bit of a different Webby episode than I thought it was going to be. I mean, I liked it. And I like that, you know, even though they did show the, the, the brothers interacting and, you know, throwing in jokes, you know, at each other, um, they still tr do try to include her. And when when it comes time for the sale and they and all four of them can't fit, one like Huey does offer to give her his seat so she can experience it. So I'm glad that it wasn't they were just you know completely ostracizing her, you know, just because it's their thing and they have to do it. I, I was really glad that they didn't go that route. And it, it especially since uh, later on later on when uh, it. Uh, when uh, she meets Selena, she tries to use that argument. Oh well, they excluded you from uh, from that from that activity. Like, are, why were you still defending them? I'm like, well, to be fair, they did try to include her, so you don't have much of an argument there. So, yeah, I, so yeah, I do I do like that very much, and I honestly I honestly sympathize with that a lot because. Uh, I've had group, groups of friends that would sort of form their own language, you know, to have all these in-jokes about things they've done in school or uh, on trips and stuff. And, yeah, I mean, it's in, it's amusing to listen to and you try to, like, you know, get the joke. But so, but at the same time, it's still kind of awkward. It's like, OK, yeah, that sounds funny. I'm, I guess but I guess I should have been there just, you know, to get the full context. But I mean, it, I thought it was, I thought it was really well done, though. Like the way they portray they portrayed her, uh, how left out she felt. Yeah, I I think they did a good job of showing both sides because it's not just a uh, oh the boys are are in the wrong kind of thing. Like they they do a good job showcasing both points of view, and they make arguments for each point of view. And no one person is right or wrong. It's just this is sometimes what happens, and we have to deal with it. And I think this is a great lesson for kids, but also told in an adult manner. Um, Eric, what do you think? I really like what they did here, and Kat makes an excellent point on how they showed both sides. Like, yeah, that they did, that Huey did do as much as they can to try to 
include Webby in. And yeah, they did show, and I liked how they showed off, you know, their own little language, you know, with especially with the whole, um, the whole uh, Louis getting everybody lost, and you know, calling them Captain, you know, calling him Captain Lost, Captain Lost, <laughs> Captain Lost, <laughs> lost Captain, Captain Lost. lost. <laughs> Why did you hand me the map? You know I was gonna get you guys lost. <laughs> <laughs> and it happens again, but. <laughs> But you I change that tone of chanting. <laughs> <laughs> but I, but I really like how they. But but like as Kat said, I liked how how they showed both sides. Like yeah, they were able. They tried to include Webby in on everything, but um, but Webby does also kind of feel a little left out because of that years of being together. Is that what she kind of wishes that she had with uh, with Huey, Dewey, and Louie? And it's nice that we, that later episode when she does meet Lena, they they eventually do have this connection. So it's also great from a show standpoint because it's not just because uh, we could easily have episodes where where Webby doesn't have to rely on where we don't have to rely on uh, Huey, Dewey, and Louie for Webby to interact with. Like, like she can bond with uh, Lena, like have like all like have like an all girls episode as opposed to just having just webby and the webby and the boys so we're so it's nice that we're actually probably going to have episodes like that especially with what we find out about lena at the end of the episode and we'll get to that we'll get to it (laughs) (laughs) um so the episode opens with this and from this point on it kind of changes directions because I thought it would be, you know, the boys would come back later and it would be like uh, one of these old school Disney, like, oh, I'm upset kind of things. But it takes a different direction. She meets up with this girl named Lena and Lena is busy putting fake notes in bottles, uh, which are hilarious because like one of them is like, help, I'm being turned. I'm I'm surrounded by uh, dolphins and uh, Webby's just like, aw, that are tearing me limb from limb. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, like, there's a lot of really funny fake notes. So she follows the fake notes and bottles to uh, see this new person named Lena. And she sees Webby's skills in action, and they, they bond. And at first, I was wondering, like, what uh, really Lena saw in Webby, because... Webby is a lot more awkward in this episode at first, but at the same time, she shows off her spy skills in action. And Lena has this cool kid attitude about her. So, you know, looking on it right now, I can kind of understand why she would take to Webby because even if she's awkward, a lot of cool kids in real life are kind of socially awkward. They can just do cool things. And I think this is a testament to that fact. She's just like, oh, so you're a ninja. Well, come on, you can run with me. Like, I I kind of like that. Yeah, I I do admit, like, at first you wonder, like, okay, why are they, why is she hanging out with her? Because clearly they don't mesh that well, because she's all, you know, laid back and cool, and Webby's all, like, outgoing and awkward. But... I mean, you you see you see them like sort of charm each other a bit. Like Webby does showcase her sk- like her skills, and like she's so happy go lucky. It's like it's hard not to like her. And then of course, like, Lena's just like she's cool about everything. I do like that she doesn't have what a lot of cool kids used to have back in the day. Is that oh look at this scrub? Well, what prove to me that you're worthy of my coolness? Like I'm glad she didn't have that like about her. She's um, not I, Robbie. She's not Robbie, thank God. Yeah. I, I do like how she's the first duck we've seen that actually has, like, a hair color other than white. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I kind of understand why they're doing it, because it, considering, you know, ducks don't have hair, like, technically, it would make sense that they're, if they did have hair, it would be white, just like the rest of their body. But I do like that she, like, di- I guess she dyes her feathers, whatever, like a nice pink and it gives her like a more of more of a unique look. So I thought that was pretty cool. There's there's a bit of pink in your hair. It it's supposed to be there. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, they they did a good job of kind of introducing this, and 
it builds to something that's actually kind of interesting because I didn't know where the episode was going from this point. This was like swerving past my expectations. And so what happens next? Lena invites her to a party. Now I'm thinking, oh, it's just a regular party. They go to a junkyard. (laughs) And she says, do your flippy thing. uh, Unlock the door because we're crashing the party. Now, the first thought that that came to my mind was, oh, she's tricking her into stealing something because, you know, 90s shows have have done that trope before. But that doesn't happen. Instead, they crash a junkyard party featuring the Beagle Boys. It's Ma Beagle's birthday, and so they're crashing the Beagle Boys' birthday party for their mother the instant that this happened, I'm like, oh my god, this is the greatest setup ever. And it's not just it's not just the, the Beagle Boys that we saw in the second episode. It's like it's like this whole convention of different be- <laughs> it's like a Beagle Boy Jamboree where they have all these different Beagle Boys from like different parts of the world and they're all have like different and they all have like different gimmicks and stuff. Like I really like I really like the like the the one with that are like the creepy clowns like the one with like the long limbs and the, the one that, like the, like the turns... tumble bums yeah the tumble bums those are those are those I thought were actually kind of cool and creepy but I just like how they're like there's all these different I love how there's all these different Beagle Boy like groups like all over and they just all gather here in this like junkyard. <laughs> Yeah, it's like you have the you have the classics, you have the deja vus, you have the South Street meanies, the South Street friendlies, and the deja vus, <laughs> and then the tumble bums, and then the deja vus. <laughs> me, me, me thinks that Ma Beagle got around back in her day. Those were a lot of beagles, like holy shit, and always in threes. <laughs> Though, to be honest, I'm not surprised, because in the original DuckTales, there was a ton of Beagle Boys, and they regularly rotated out of, like, the main three. Like, there was one episode where, like, a whole bunch of them just freaking storm Scrooge's money bins, and I lost track of how many Beagle Boys there were. Like, there had to be, like, at least 30, and I'm like, Jesus Christ, what do they breed in, like... 10, 15, like, litters or whatever? Like, dear God. (laughs) (laughs) Um, My first thought when I first saw this this part of the episode was, like, do you remember the Venture Brothers episode where they infiltrate the villain conference? Um, Yes. They have every single villain there, and I'm like, this is really cool. So I was thinking about that the whole time, but I love the diversity on, on display um, they also have like the uh, the ugly failures or something like that, like the the worst <laughs> Beagle Boys, and there's so many diverse people. Oh, there, there's also the Taquitos, uh, um, who are the they're basically like um, extreme uh, borders. They're like '90s versions of characters. So yes, <laughs> and they're hilarious too. Like there's so much diversity on display, and I love that. I love that. And they they crash the party, and Webby finds out that the Beagle Boys are here. Now the first she, thing she says is like, "Okay, we gotta get out of here before they find us." And Lena's like, "Ah, they won't figure out it's us." And then immediately, immediately somebody recognizes Webby. And Ma Beagle like tries to ca- like says, "Oh yeah, by the way, it's my birthday, and so for my present, capture them." <laughs> to be fair, I don't know how they expected to get away with being there, considering everyone who was there was a Beagle boy. It's like I don't even understand how Lena could have like thought that she would have gotten away with it by herself. Like, I mean, come on, like, come on. <laughs> And honestly, I don't, I don't really blame them for acting the way they did. I mean, you know, they are on their turf, and it is their mother's birthday, and they pretty much crash it. Like, that, that's not cool, guys. That, not cool. Not cool. <laughs> I, I think it makes sense given what we're going to find out later. Um, and, you know, what we find out later explains a lot of Lena's behavior. But I don't want to give anything away until we get to that point. Mm-hmm. So, chaos ensues. 
Oh god. Um like there's so many <laughs> wonderful things happening. Uh so they run away and they try to hide and they get chased by various different groups of Beagle Boys and you get to see each different one in action. I think that's really, really cool. You get to see the cool boarders use flying suits to get across <laughs> the gap, and then they take care of the taquitos, and then uh, they go into another area, and they trick the uglies <laughs> into th- into thinking that they're beagle birds, and they start talking all British, and it's the best thing ever. <laughs> and somehow this works. <laughs> well, I've I, I believe they're supposed to be like a parody of the original like Beagle Boys from the from from the original Ducktales because they were that stupid. I won't lie, they were indeed that stupid. <laughs> <laughs> they, they're yeah. like, okay, we're the Beagle Birds. They start talking like you know croissants and stuff like that, and they take the radio so they can listen in on Ma and figure out what's going on. Um, and as soon as the garage door closes, they're like. Wait a minute, was that them? <laughs> yeah, we should mention, like, what, as soon as, like, the Beagle Boys start hunting them, pretty much the entire plot of the episode turns into the plot of the warrior. Like, it, it is so overt between the different groups hunting down these this one group... Um, they're the they have like that sh- that voice in the shadows talking to them over the intercom, uh, directing them where to find the group. And then, of course, just to be even more overt, one of the uh, the ugly failures has those green bottles on his fingers that he's playing with. So it's like, okay, now now you're just now- <laughs> now you're just being way too obvious here. <laughs> like I, I am, fr- I am really surprised. At one point, they didn't try to do like a parody of that famous catchphrase. Like, oh, Can warriors, you... come out and play! <laughs> I'm surprised they didn't do the "Can you dig it?" <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> like, then again, I could see why they didn't do that because I don't know how that would have worked in the context of that episode. Like, I know what it was trying to be, but like, I don't, I don't think they would have been able to work it in without forcing, without feeling like it's forced. Because everything else just kind of flows. Because everything else in the episode just kind of flows. But yeah, this this is amazing parody of the warriors, and you have all these different groups coming. Um, after they take care of those two like regular groups, and they keep on running, uh, they end up at night in the middle of a playground where they meet up with Huey, Dewey, and Louie, who have been searching for Webby for hours. Why they didn't, you know, ask Uncle Scrooge for help is anybody's guess, but. You know, they they found each other. And yeah, Scroo- it, Scrooge doesn't appear in this episode. It's the first time. Yeah, this <laughs> is the first time. Um, that's kind of interesting. Uh, <laughs> they do a lot of interesting things in this episode. First of all, they make fun of the old show by saying, oh, what do you mean these interchangeable people? They're all wet- wearing matching sweaters and outfits. Uh, what are you, like, doing the triplet thing? And they all start speaking in unison at the same time, and they can't stop. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen a YouTube video like that where, like, for for at least five minutes straight, these guys keep talking at the same time, and they can't seem to stop. And it gets to the point where, like, one of them has where that one of them ends up killing themselves just to get it to stop. But then the guy talks to somebody else, and it starts right back up again. That's kind of <laughs> what it reminded me of. <laughs> I, I just love it at the same time they all yell, what was it, uh, anti de, was it anti de establishmentarianism anti disestablishmentarianism <laughs> which I rolled over the, which I rolled over laughing because it's a, it, because funny enough, it's an inside joke between me and my, between me and my friends from college, because, you know, because, uh, a friend of ours that I knew, uh, in college actually used, used to said, used to say that a lot just for the hell of it. So it just that so I got a laugh out of that one. <laughs> <laughs> it, that reminded me of a, a pup named Scooby Doo where they utilize that catchphrase, and I'm like, oh. Um, so you have th- the meeting of the two groups, and Lena is starting to feel a little bit ostracized. She's just like, you know, these guys are the guys who ditched you, and like we should just hang together. Um, but before they can do anything, the tumble bombs come in. And maybe this was inspired by the new It film that came out, but these guys Mm -hmm. are creepy. And 
It's like a Cirque du Soleil went gothic. Yeah, really. <laughs> you have one guy who has a mask with his face on backwards, so it looks like he has two faces, and you can never tell where he's coming from. And uh, when he, like, crawls along the floor, so you don't know if he's crawling on his back or on his front. And uh, you have another one who's on stilts and, like, r- like a huge spider. And the other one's kind of like a monkey. It's just, like... The, they come in in the middle of the darkness. Uh, the only warning is the radio saying, oh, they've entered the Tumble Bums territory. And they're like, the Tumble Bums? Oh, well, they can't be that tough. And then silence. <laughs> it's like nightmare fuel. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love how at, at one point when uh, they're trying to escape, initially escape the Tumble Bums, um, Lena tries to get tries to get webby to to uh, ditch the net to ditch the triplets you know saying that oh they left you behind like so we we don't need them like don't you trust me and i'm like you're the reason she's in this situation and you expect her to trust you really <laughs> it's like <laughs> yeah that is a like, bit it, much yeah it's like i i i I kind of get the mentality, given what we learn later, but the fact that she expects her, that she expects Webby to trust her right off the bat after they met that very day, and the very first thing they did, she got her, she got her into that situation where they're now, like, where they could possibly be murdered, and she's just like, oh, why don't you trust me? It's like, really? Really? Come on. (laughs) But what really happens is... Uh, I think it's Louie. Louie creates a distraction, so they take out uh, the three tumble bums with bananas, which I thought was was really funny. Like, what's the best way to take out a creepy clown? Just, you know, throw a banana peel on the ground. I just say, like, they turned an old cliche into something useful. Like, kudos, show. Kudos. (laughs) Well played. Um, And so they get away, but it, it seems like Lena has ditched them. Uh, and they cut to later where they're on the beach, like, wondering, like, why Lena just left. And you're starting to think, oh, maybe she betrayed them because, you know, hey, you know, she was kind of acting a little bit jerky earlier. But they get a message in a bottle that she's been kidnapped by the Beagle Boys. And so you never really can tell in this initial bits what side that Lena is on. Is she someone trustworthy is she just going to ditch someone? Like, she has some red flags going about her, but at the same time, you can kind of understand, well, she acts like a teenager, you know, she kind of gets herself into trouble and is a little bit of a loner, and she mentions that she doesn't like family. So when Webby's family comes back, she's kind of feels ostracized. So you you don't know whether to feel like, is she betraying you know is she betraying them and like leaving them alone or like what's going on and when you get the note that she's been captured you're like okay that makes sense yeah and then they go to try to rescue her but it doesn't go well and they all (laughs) they all end up getting captured um so yeah they're pretty much in a pretty bad situation but uh, luckily, they both come up with a idea, with a brilliant idea to make them fight, and it's this usual trope where Lena asks them, "Oh, by the way, who's getting the credit for capturing us?" Which immediately turns them all against each other, and you know, hilarity and f- lots of like f- fun, like fighting banter ensues. <laughs> it's really cool to see all the different gangs fighting against each other. Uh, also, like I really like the little bit at the beginning when they're first captured, where the the South Street nice nices give them a glass of water, and then the meanies immediately throw it away. <laughs> 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 um, but yeah, you get to see all of these different groups fighting and beating the crap out of each other, and you get to see all their different skills. Like you can see, uh, one of them tries to poke out the eyes of one of the tumble bums, and he turns around to with his actual face and like decks him out. And then uh, one of the brawlers uh, steps on a skateboard and falls down and gets like football smash. And it's like it's like one of the old school goofy cartoons, um, but 
just ramped up to 11. I really love this sequence. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. I like I like how one of the deja vus was using like a baguette to try to whack on one of the other Beagle Boys. <laughs> it's like, what do you think about it? It's the perfect weapon, especially once it's gone stale. <laughs> <laughs> and coming from someone who works in food, yes, <laughs> that is a very <laughs> useful weapon. <laughs> so they use this confusion to escape and everyone goes home. They see Lena off to her home, and, you know, everything's fine and dandy. Uh, before we talk about the ending, uh, overall, what I like about this episode is it it was a character episode, but it also seemed to just, you know, take a breather, take a step back. It wasn't quite as focused on the character as the previous Webby episode. It was more focused on telling us good jokes, a very good parody, just giving us a fun time, and throughout the majority of the episode, I'm like, this is enough. Not all episodes have to be very good character-specific episodes or story episodes. They just have to present something enjoyable and fun. And this, uh, this really cements the fact that this is a great show to me because we've had five episodes in a row. I don't think any of them are weak. I don't think any of them are bad. I think all of them are great. And they're all different. Like... We've had story episodes, we've had character episodes, now here's just an episode that's just interested in having a good time, while having a little bit of character into the mix, and I really like that. Yeah, I pretty much agree with all you said. I mean, the ending is really what makes seals it for me, like, but for the most part, yeah, this was, the, before that point, the whole episode in and of itself was a lot of fun. Like, getting to see the different Beagle Boys, seeing Webby use her various, like, talents to get them out of sticky, sticky situations, and just the way they go about everything, it's just, it's a lot of fun. It's very entertaining to watch. So, yeah, like, I thought this was going to be another typical, you know, ca character episode, that was going to go through the motions, but it actually made it interesting. So, bravo. Bravo, show. <laughs> I actually thought this would just be a typical Beagle Boys episode, and I thought it was maybe a little bit too soon since we had the Beagle Boys earlier, but they did so much more different with it that I'm just like, okay, this works. Like, this does enough new, enough different from the previous episode where I'm like, yeah, I really like that. Um, Eric, uh... What do you think of this episode partially before we get into the big ending bit? I like how we actually have another character that's introduced. And this one, we, from what we're about to talk about in the ending, is going to be another reoccurring character. And I like how we have another one that for Webby to bounce off of as opposed to just Huey, Dewey, and Louie. I know I've said this before, but that's one of the big uh, things that I like about this. It's that... Now we're getting, now that this reboot can do, like, new characters that they want to, and now that they've created Lena as a new character for somebody for Webby to bounce off of, so we can get a Webby episode, a Webby center, a, we can get a Webby-centered episode that doesn't involve, necessarily have to involve Huey, Dewey, and Louie. We can just have, we could just be another uh, Webby and Lena episode, and I kind of look forward to seeing another one of those and what kind of mischief the two of them can easily get into. <laughs> or, or maybe like Webby will show Lena something as something around as in this as opposed to this episode where Lena is showing Webby something. So we could see something like that. Can I talk about the sure ending? Sure, we will. <laughs> can I talk about the yeah. ending? Can I set it up? Yes, you can set up the ending. Go on, go on, Eric. Okay, 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 good. All right. So, um, so at the very end of the episode, uh, Lena is wearing is, has this uh, pendant that she's been wearing. Uh, they mentioned this in the beginning of the episode when uh, Webby first meets Lena. She has like this mis this weird like mystical pendant or whatever. Um, for I mean, we, for us the audience, we probably have gathered that it is some sort of mystical artifact or whatever. So at the end of the episode, uh, Lena comes back to the place where she got captured by all the Beagle Boys and where the big Beagle Boy fight uh, took place. So she takes out her pendant and already it starts like reacting and stuff. So like it creates like this almost like a mystical, like, I don't want to say it's a portal, like more like, like a communication kind of thing to talk to someone. And we get all these like shadows and stuff and we get a shadowy figure of a female duck and 
Lena says, Aunt Magica, I'm in. And it's I knew cu- it! <laughs> and, it cu- okay. and we see the shadowy Ooh. figure of of uh, Lady Magica. Or, and, you know, with a big grin on her face. And it ends the episode. I fucking knew it! Uh, got it! <laughs> this ending, um, this is why I wanted to, like, save our, uh, put, like, our, our first initial overall thoughts and then do this because, like, this changes everything. Hell yeah, it does. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first of all, like, this is now a partially story, partially character, partially just a fun episode. But this ending sets up so much. It's like, it is basically the refrigerator scene in the first season of Gravity Falls, where you first get the idea that something is going on. And it continues on things that audience members would probably know about. The fact that Magicka Dispel is one of the main villains but it does it in such a subtle way. Like, even if you don't know who Magicka Dispel is, uh, the setup is just intriguing. You're like, wait a second, Lena was evil the whole time. And you look back through the episode, and it makes a lot of sense why she was so keen on talking to Webby, even though she was awkward. Why uh, she had uh, her break into the Beagle Boys residence. Like, why, uh, you know, she kind of left at the drop of a hat. Like, there's a lot of things that are really pinpoint her being evil but they framed it in such a way that you really couldn't tell until that ending and that ending reveal just oh my god i need to see more (laughs) (laughs) we'll get more next week like i love how we keep getting endings like that with this like the the first episode for the pilot it was the reveal of della duck uh for the uh for the end of the Great Dime Chase, it was uh, the, the Gyro working on uh, Project Blatherskite, and now we have this with Magicka. It's like I love this. Yes, this is what keeps things exciting. Like I love it. it's so good. And they they keep they keep doing this too because like in addition to Gyro's thing, they also revealed a little bit about the Spear of Selene in that episode too. So it's like you kind of have to wait. You kind of have to wait till the end to really know if something is going to happen or not. And even in unassuming episodes like this, major plot points can drop near the end of the episode. This, this is brilliant. And it's not just brilliant storytelling. It's brilliant marketing. It's what Marvel did with their end credit scenes. It keeps you watching till the very end, which is what they want you to do. Like, yeah, like, it, it's like you're having this nice little pleasure cruise, and all of a sudden I get, fuck, I get like, slammed on the side with this big heap, heaping thing of plot, and it's like, you know what, I don't care if I'm in the hospital for six weeks, this is awesome! <laughs> 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 no, I just want to say, I knew it! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I wasn't completely right, but I knew Magica would be a big baddie in this, considering how they did not talk about her at all before this before this episode and you don't see her on the opening credits or anything like not even like you know uh not even like art of her so yeah uh i'm so glad that they're making her a big baddie and it's oh god i can't wait to see her she's my favorite villain from this it's gonna be so great <laughs> okay so my question to both of you with this reveal what are your final thoughts on the episode eric i want you to start off because Like, I know you started us off on, like, what this reveal was, but because this ending changes everything, what are your true final thoughts on this episode? Well, I do like how it's setting everything up for what the remaining season is going to be about eventually, but um, I will say this, I mean... The question where it comes down to is the way the stuff that they've been revealing in the last couple of episodes. Does this set up for saying that Della Duck is Magicka Dispel? That's the one thing that I thought was go- that that we thought, and I think Kat mentioned this before the of that possibility. I will play. Yeah. De- I will play devil's advocate in saying that while officially this doesn't confirm it. It does set itself up to going in that direction. You know, we find out about, you know, who Della Duck is and something about the, you know, the, the Sword of Shireen, you know, that whole, that whole debacle. And now with the reveal of Lady, of, 
uh, Magicka Dispel, this kind of sets up like how all these things are probably going to tie in at some point, and it could easily lead into with how Deladuck became Magicka Dispel at some point somewhere within those series of events. Yeah, I'm definitely seeing it going in that direction. I, like, it would be an interesting twist for Magicka to actually have been their mom the whole time. Like, whoa. <laughs> I mean, I think at at most, that is what's going to happen. At the very least, I would think at least she was maybe un serving Magicka. Maybe she's either uh, brainwashed or, you know, under a spell. Or she just decided to, you know, go with Magicka because she thought she was on the winning side. I mean, I feel like the two are connected somehow. Cause that's just how I... It's just, you know, an instinct that I feel. That it's... The two will tie in in some way or form. I mean, if they don't, that's fine. You know, but I mean, it would be really cool if they did go in that direction. Or... Or... Something or. I've been thinking about. What if Lena is Della Duck? Now, hear me out for a second. This is a little bit of a stretch, but think about this for a second. The Spear of Selene was the, the thing that was, you know, thing that was stolen. What if the Spear of Selene de-ages you or something like that? And so you now have Selena, Selene, Lena, who's working for Magicka. Um, I'm not sure about that theory. Is I mean... I would think, like, I don't know, it's, it's, it's hard, like, I think it's a bit weird, especially because, you know, when she meets the boys, she obviously doesn't recognize them and even acts a little, you know, jerkish toward them. I mean, if they were her kids, would she really be acting that way toward them? I mean, unless she got her memory erased or something. But they, but... they act like they never <laughs> met their mother, though. Yeah, I know that, but you think... You think she would know something about her kids? I mean, she kn I assume she knows that she has kids. She she was was their mother. It just I don't know. It, it I I don't see that really panning out that well. Um I'm not sh I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> not not to blow down, not to shoot down your theory or anything. It just doesn't seem plausible to me as of as of right now. <laughs> we'll see what happens. That is currently my theory and I'm sticking to it, especially because if she is under Magicka Dispel's spell, that could explain a few things. I do well, have another theory, though. Okay. okay. Uh, my other theory is that if Della Duck is not Magicka Dispel, then maybe Della Duck took the Spear of... Was it the Spirit or is it the Sword of Shireen? I just want to make the sure. The Spear of Selene. All right. What if... Uh, what if she took Della Duck took the spear of Shireen from uh, from the uh, you know from Donald and Scrooge McDuck in order to protect in order to protect her sons in order to protect Huey Dewey and Louie from something like as kind of like an exchange you know like she kind of did it as a way to kind of protect the boys. It's like, you, you know, you give me the spear or I will or I will track you down and I will take your kids you know I will you know, I will go after your family for forever and ever, you know, that kind of thing. And maybe, okay, did th I, and maybe I see did that as being way more plausible. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that's another, that's another thing. I, I, I still want to, I still want to go with the whole, uh, Della Duck being Magicka Dispel. I still want to go with that. Cause I still think that's way more interesting and a much, much more bigger twist. But the other, but the other theory, I still kind of feel like that could, that could also be another possibility. I mean, either or is pretty good. I mean, I do like your theory. Like I said, it's a lot more plausible and, you know, makes sense in the scheme of things. Because, you know, why else would she betray her brother and uncle and, you know, pretty much abandon her sons, you know, all for this artifact, which we, as of now, know nothing about. So mm -hmm. I, I could definitely see what you mean by that. Because the Spear of Selene, I assume, has something to do with the moon. Because, you know, Selene being the goddess of the moon. So I assume there's some sort of magical properties to it, which, you know, is magic that dispels things. So I could definitely see that, you know, de happening, at, or at least being a plot point. Um, I, will, I will say this, though. I, ac I actually did a bit of research into Lena, because I was curious as to whether she was 
an an original character for the for this sh- this version of the show, or if she was based on some pre existing character either from the original Ducktales or from the comics. And I actually did find something, believe it or not. Um, it turns out that Magica Dispel actually does have a niece in the comics, and her name is Minima. And apparently, according to the uh, the comics that I'm looking at right now, uh, she did actually help Magica in trying to obtain Scrooge's number one dime at times. And, I mean, there's not much listed about her. Um, I, I think at most it's assumed that she's the daughter of Magica's brother, who in the original show was turned into a crow and kind of became his sister's familiar. Um, the other thing I noticed was pretty interesting is that she starts off as a bad guy, but she later becomes good. So I'm wondering if that might actually happen in this show that, you know, Lena starts off, you know, serving her aunt, trying to, you know, weasel her way into the McDuck mansion, trying to, you know, help match go with her plans. But she develops a deep friendship with Webby and the boys and eventually ends up turning against her aunt. So I'm I could wondering see if that's that the- happening. Yeah, because I I have a feeling that's where it's going, because, I mean, even though, yes, she pretty much, you know, lied to them the whole episode and, you know, has, you know, been not revealing certain things and we could definitely tell that she's there just to be a rat, I I still feel like there's goodness in her. I mean, she doesn't seem completely fake. So, yeah, yeah, I think there is possibility for that happening. There are times where I feel like she was very genuine, like when she was talking about family you saw a change in her attitude that you didn't see any other time. And I felt like um, her family fighting, you know, that could reference, uh, like, Magica fighting with her brother or something like that. Um, There's a lot of things that are very vague about this. And that's what I love, because a good mystery show has to have a lot of mystery behind it. It can't show its cards. And much like Gravity Falls, which in in and of itself was a mystery show, it doesn't give us everything. It drip feeds us information. It gives us just enough to make us contemplate, like, what does this mean? But the thing with DuckTales is that it's already an established universe, which is different from Gravity Falls. Like, Gravity Falls was completely new, whereas DuckTales, you know, we could see some things coming. But they're doing things in such a way as to modernize it and update it. And some things are the way they were before, and some things aren't. So we can't entirely predict what's going to happen. And shrewd fans might get some subtle nods and winks and might see some things coming. Like, Kat was talking to us about Magicka Dispel uh, just last episode. And now we have this little bit of information. And so... Shrewd fans would be able to get little things like, oh, Magicka's not around, or the Beagle Boys, this and that. But it's done in such a way that you're constantly guessing what direction this show is going to take, but it has a very clear direction that it wants to go from the start, and I like that, I really do, because it's it's taking the adventure aspect of the original show but putting in so much more mystery, so much more intrigue, that you have to watch every single episode to know what's going to happen next, and that is very unprecedented in a kid's show. Yeah, I pretty much agree with what you say right there. I mean, all the intrigue that's building up, it's like, ugh, it's like, I miss this. Like, I love it when shows do this, but not enough shows do. And the fact that we have not one, not two, but three mysteries going on right now, as well as probably a bunch of others I'm not even thinking of. It's just, oh, God. It's like, (laughs) I want to see more. (laughs) And and not, not all of them are related to Uncle Scrooge either. Like, some of them are related to, uh, to the nephews and Webby and, and some of it's just, independent of Scrooge, like, obviously the gyro connection and Magic of Dispel, but a lot of it is just like, okay, uh, there's stuff surrounding them, and never has it been a better time to say life is like a hurricane here in Duckburg, because a hurricane's a-coming. Mm-hmm. 
great That's... storm is brewing. <laughs> Winter is coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... Yeah, this... Yeah, so I, I'm just going to say my final thoughts right now. Like, just based on the ending alone, I absolutely love this episode. Like, I love the references. I love the character development, the introduction of Lena, the big plot twist at the end, you know, the fact that we're getting this new big baddie. It's just, oh man, th this episode excited me so much. I absolutely love it. I mean, at times, th there were times where I, it left me scratching my head, you know, Lena's whole convoluted plot to get Webby to trust her and become her friend is a bit hard to believe at times, considering how often they could have gotten caught or killed. <laughs> but, I mean... I, I mean, it's it's not that big a deal. I mean, the chase is really what's the big draw here. So, I de I definitely I definitely am glad like this episode surprised me because I really thought it was going to be another generic character episode, and who boy was it anything but. So yeah, I love it. This episode could have just been a character episode, and I probably would have been fine with it. It could have been just a fun, entertaining warriors parody. And I would have been fine with that because, like I said in my initial, like, first half final thoughts, like, that was great. But with this reveal, with this twist, uh, I'm just, I'm so on board. I am, like, I'm glued to my television right now. I'm like, give me another episode. Let, let, we need to talk about this. <laughs> Make it Saturday already. <laughs> I'm sure I, I'm sure the audience is wondering like where, where when's the next episode gonna be talked about and stuff like that. So we're we're just as excited as you guys. Like we want to talk more about these these episodes because this is the most intrigued I've been for a show since Attack on Titan and Gravity Falls. And those are two amazing shows. And here we have another show that really surprised me because I like DuckTales. You know, I, I, like I said, I, I liked the movie. I like DuckTales in general. Um, but I was more excited for, like, Darkwing Duck-style stuff. But if they can do this with just the DuckTales 2017, I wonder what they can do with Darkwing Duck and possibly Gargoyles if they ever do that. Well, I mean, it's possible. You know, they did make references to the other Disney tunes like Goof Troop and Tailspin, so who knows? It would definitely be an interesting thing to explore. <laughs> yeah, that's gonna be next. That's gonna be next. Our speculation of when they're gonna do Darkwing. When are they gonna show Darkwing Duck? When is the Darkwing Duck reveal gonna be? <laughs> what, what what's it gonna be like at the end? Someone says, "Let's get dangerous." I'm like, uh, I'm waiting. I'm I'm just <laughs> waiting on edge for that. Oh my god. With all that being said, um, this this has been a fan fantastic episode i had a lot of fun with this one um especially when i got to that ending and uh i you know sitting down watching this you know this show is worth it this show like even just five episodes in i am so hooked in any case i am zenith rule i'm cat mcberry i'm eric y2 staller and this has been yet another episode of Diving Into DuckTales. We had so much to talk about this week. We can't wait for next week where we get to talk about the next episode. Please continue the discussion in the comments thread. Let us know what you guys think. We've already heard from a couple of our fans from last week, uh, but we want to hear what you guys think. Let us know. Also, you can follow us on social media. Uh, I am at Zenith Will Rule on Twitter. There's Y2Staller, also has a Twitter, and Kat McBerry is at Ephraim T. Rabbit, although she doesn't use Twitter that often. Uh, but we also have Facebook pages. You can follow us, all our hijinks, at the Disney Debate Facebook page. Just search on Facebook for Project Disney slash The Disney Debate, and you will find uh, our Facebook group, Ask to Join. And you can talk to us about Disney and, and other Disney-related stuff, including DuckTales, including what we're talking about right now. Or, if you don't like that, you can always just, you know, continue this discussion in the comments and talk to us that way. 
With all that being said, we will see you guys next week for hopefully another fantastic episode. I don't think they're going to let us down after all this amazingness, but you never know. We'll see. I'm intrigued. With that said, we will see you guys next time. Have a good one, guys. Hey, Zenith. I'm in. Let's get dangerous. Hey, this is Megami33. Thank you for watching Zenith Will Review. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe for more awesome videos. If you like what you see, check out the Patreon page at patreon.com slash zenithwillreview.